You're listening to the Yeshiva of Newark at IDT podcast. I'm your host and curator, Rabbi Aprom Kipolevich, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Shalom. This is To Stir With Love, a criminal justice reform podcast. I'm here with Rabbi Yitzchak Kolokowski, who, of course, is the chief of chaplaincy at Waymart uh, Prison in Waymart, Pennsylvania. And through uh, Rabbi Yitzchak, we have a very special guest here tonight with us, uh, Chief uh, Maurice Demond, also known as uh, Chief Gentleman, who works together with Yitzchak and is going to give um, some uh, some of the salient details of your life, some of the, the story of the odyssey that brought you from where you were to where you are now, uh, working with the prison population, and in general, the spiritual sure. journey. So, Chief, thank you so much, uh, Chief Gentleman. And, and, and why don't you start us off by telling us wh- how you would uh, be addressed uh, by the people of, of your tribe using their language. They wouldn't call you Chief Gentleman. They would call you, why don't you let us hear that once at least. Yes, uh, my Lenape Yunami dialect, uh, my name would be Sakima Toke Pesquami Kishok, which means uh, Chief Gentleman. It actually means Chief Little Son, because in our ancient dialect, the sun was Kishok and the moon, because it was a, a dimmer light, was the little sun, and he was Pesquami Kishok. She was Pesquami Kishok. Uh-huh. Oh, I love what you just said. And Yitzchak, I know his ears are pricking up here too, because we have a, a tradition of the moon being sort of the feminine aspect and the sun being the more yes. masculine one. So this is very similar. Yes, in, our, in our mystical tradition, we look at the moon mm-hmm. as, a, as, a, as a feminine image, uh, the Levana. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so that, so, and it's, actually, it's actually like a smaller version of the sun. Uh-huh. Yes. And, and, and which yes. uh, of those words, which one means chief? Which word meant chief? Sakima. Sakima is chief. Sakima. Yeah. And which word means gentle or kinder or small? Is which one would be gentle? Which one would that be would gentle? be uh, toke. 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 Uh huh. Yeah. That much, that that I got. I think so. We're gonna be. <laughs> we're gonna go. We're gonna go toke with you here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because, because we know we're dealing with a sakama. And we're going to be okay with you. We're going to go gentle here. Uh, so, 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 so tell us, uh, Chief, um, first of all, um, tell us, you know, how you became a chief. I mean, clearly you are, sure. you are a descendant of uh, the Lenape, but how is it that you are a chief? Yes. Yitzchak and I studied to become rabbis, although Yitzchak claims uh, descendants of great rabbis, as I do. It, doesn't, it didn't come, it's not in my blood. I had to earn this. How did you become a chief? What was the odyssey that brought yes. you to the Well, uh, it, it would start out, I guess, with um, the study of being under a chief, um, being taken in under his wing, I guess you would say, uh, and that would be uh, Chief Whipperwell Thompson. Um, when I grew up, at the time that I grew up, um, during the 60s and 70s, um, as a child my parents and my grandparents both um we we lived a native lifestyle but we did not celebrate our culture at all it was very dangerous to be known as indigenous people um living in this colonial environment because <laughs> where, where was um, that where, where where did you grow up uh i grew up in uh, a little town called delaware new jersey um it's, it's right in the shadow of the delaware water gap right along the river and uh, my ancestral homeland, I was fortunate enough to be uh, one of the people that stayed behind, the descendants of the people that stayed behind to where I didn't have to grow up on a reservation. I, did, I grew up, you know, in a family life, um, albeit um, really uh, dysfunctional because of some of the uh, policies that the government had against uh, indigenous people at the time. Um, so a lot of that was, um, you know, a lot of anger from my grandfather. He didn't like who he was. Um, he didn't like being, uh, Indian and he thought it was a curse. So from that, you know, growing up, I knew all the, the traditional things that we did, like living off the land, all the, um, 
gathering of things that we did, the large gardens, the the sustenance that we had by using smoked uh, game and smoked fish year round. We lived on that. We hardly ever went to the store. But on the other side of that, we were taught, my father and his brothers and sister were especially taught to be ashamed of who they were. So when I came back to the culture in uh, my later 20s, after suffering through a long time of, you know, the same thing my my family went through with alcoholism and, and, um, you know, other things like that, violence and, and just some really bad things going on. I came back to my culture and that's when I started to understand the ache, the general generational ache that there was by being oppressed by the government that we live under. I see. Um, Look, can I just stop you for a second, Chief? Um, sure. And uh, I can't, you know, and I know that you were opening up, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the, your, your, as we say in Yiddish, your kishkas, we're opening up mm-hmm. your insides. <laughs> we're opening up the, yes. we're opening up your innards here. And, and, I, and, yeah. and, and, and I really appreciate it. I just have a question. There are, you yes. know, the, the, the saga that you're beginning to tell us parallels mm-hmm. for many the story of many Jewish people who came to these shores yes. and found themselves being forced to assimilate. However, yes. is, here's the question I want to ask you. Among certain group of Jews who outwardly acted very much like the Gentile American colonial, as you call it, society, there still was a certain um, line we didn't cross, which was who we married and who we married to. Was that true in your with your people as well? What I mean is your mother's families were they also from the the, the indigenous peoples or did you in, introduce uh, people from outside of the tribes uh like no in, in our cases there was a lot of outsiders we we assimilated in with um a lot of uh especially here in pennsylvania we assimilated uh, a lot of the situations were that the pennsylvania dutch really enjoyed the way the women worked the farms <laughs> so they would take a, a Lenape wife, you know, just because she was such a good farm worker. <laughs> so, I hear, I hear. You know, and, and it worked. Kind of did, a, did it go the other way? Did some of the Amish fellows convert to Lenape as well? Not so. Much. No, it was it was always it was always a situation of. Um, but uh, the women had to be subjugated to the to the oh, men's. But your women, in other words, your mothers. You know, in, in, yes. in Judaism, as Yitzchak will tell you, everything is matrilineal in terms yes, of. Same thing with of us. Right. So, in other words, your mothers, like for example, your mother was from the people. Is that true? Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. It, right. So, in other words, and my father, really, both of them. But what, what happened was during the times of um, the early 1900s. We were so decimated tribally that a lot of families lost track of their indigenous um, connections. So both of my parents grew up in the mainstream society, not doing anything indigenous, you know, not, not, and no ceremonies whatsoever. They weren't allowed to do it. If they did it, it was very much secretive. Um, so it was, it was a lot of hiding and a lot of um, uh, denial going on there, you know. So even though she, you know, found out later in life and retraced her lineage back to knowing that who she was, it was all denied to her by her parents, you know, and her grandparents because it was it was a situation of not wanting to have the government come in and take their children away so 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 in other words you grew up uh chief uh, knowing that you were descendants of the of the let's quote unquote the indian people but basically you went to a regular public school and swore allegiance and did christmas plays and pageants and basically saw yourself as a all-american kid from delaware new jersey yes but I never, I never played a pilgrim at the Thanksgiving feast. <laughs> uh, so, so your 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 friends, but you said you were embarrassed though. You didn't want to tell your buddies at recess. Who well, you were because descended. because of everything that that happened back then. Um, a, a lot of that is a lot of issues of, um, you know, my grandfather 
you know, he, he didn't grow up on a reservation. He grew up in a small town. He was just the product of being from native people. And they came and took him away and put him in uh, boarding school for five years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it didn't matter if you were quote unquote living on a reservation or not, if they found out you were Indian, they were coming to get you. And, you know, as recently as 20 years ago, uh, when I started this, um, the, my process of becoming chief, I had elders tell me that they still, as recently as the 90s, they didn't want to talk about being Indian because they were afraid the government was going to come and take everything. Again. Wow. Wow. Incredible. You know, so, so, so what was it that, you know, as you were having this sort of, um, uh, sort of existence like you say that was so frustrating and in many ways mm -hmm. disturbing but normal for your people what was it that that caused the shift for you to decide that you wanted to return to your roots and to discover spiritual energies and growth back to where you came from where you were formed from what, what was it that spurred that the, the umbilical cord that we have to this land right here the homelands the the the, the tie that we have metaphysically, um, spiritually, culturally. Um, like I said, I grew up on the river. So it, it, everything about my ancestry was there. I grew up right there, you know, on the river and in the homelands of where the ancestors walk. And there's a pull back to that um, that you don't even realize because you're spending your life trying to numb the pain of what other people have done to you and what you have been forced into, but there's an awakening at certain times in our life, I believe, where, you know, you, you have to stop up and take um, inventory of what you're doing. And I was blessed to be able to find some people that could tell me, look, you know, we knew your grandfather, we know your ancestry, we know who you are. And now you need to get back to helping your people because that's what you're here for. You're not here to be a drunk. You're not here to um, just waste your life away with drugs and alcohol. You are here for a purpose. You are here to be able to help people and walk a better path. And that that's what led me back um, to my culture. I spent years as, as a young man, I spent years not fitting in anywhere, no matter how much I tried to be, you know, the life of the party or the, or the good best friend or anything. It was always a matter of that, that self awareness of like, I don't quite fit in here. And then when you meet the people that you belong with, they approach you and come up to you and say, Hey, welcome home. You know, and that's what my elder did. That's what Chief Thompson did. He came up and just embraced me and said, you, you need to come back to your people now and, and help and, your people. And, and, and Chief, did the Chief Whipperwill, did he uh, start a series of, of study with you? Did he start? Like, we know what, yes. in our culture, you have to start with the Talmud, with the, with the laws, and you have to study them and know them and the, the Siddur. So you went yep. through some, you went through some, uh, we call it the yeshiva. <laughs> you went to yes. the, uh, you went through some training. So how many, yes, how, long did, how long did that intense training period take for you to become re or acquainted for the first time with the depth right. and the spiritual greatness of your traditions? How long did that take? I would say uh, I studied with uh, Chief Thompson for um, 10 years. I would say it was a 10 year period wow. before I became, and then I became uh, assistant chief to uh, Chief Bob Redhawk. He was put in place as chief and then I was his assistant. And that was probably another uh, five to eight years studying with him and also with other elders. You know, it wasn't just one person. It was, um, there was a lot of, a lot of time spent with uh, clan mothers, grandmothers, um, you know, the women telling me, you know, what they expect me to do. Uh, we still, as even as chief, I still have to, I still answer to the clan mothers. I can be the public face. You know, I can be the one out there fighting for indigenous rights. And I can be the one out there talking about our tribal ways and stuff. But I, I better make sure the grandmothers and the aunties are on board with what I'm saying. Because when I come back home, 
<laughs> I'm good. You, you know, they're going to be in trouble when I get back home. <laughs> I see. You still answer to them is, you know, we, we have such a corrupt vision of what your life is and it's been corrupted by mm. by by the colonialists who have run yeah. hollywood and have, have given us these negative stereotypes uh you, you know that uh, joe and i Yitzhak and i of course are movie buffs and we talk about films and mm-hmm. and 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 and, yes. and 90 percent of what we have seen what's been exposed to us has not been positive for you fellows uh it's right. not been positive for you but i sort of have an idea and i might it might be coming out of like the idiocy that I watched when I was a child, that part of your training might have also been not just words, but deeds going out and perhaps going into the forest and yes, and and and, and connecting to the to the to the wildlife and knowing how to. Am I right? The part of it was also hands-on stuff. One, one of our biggest ceremonies is called um, the Vision Quest or Standing Out, and that's the process of going out into. A, a selected area, usually on a mountaintop or on a hilltop, and uh, it's, it's also called going out on the hill. And uh, you do certain ceremonies to break your body down to be able to get your vision of what you need to do for your people. So that that's part of the process is going out in the woods and fasting and praying. Uh, usually for four days and four nights, we'll go out and do that. And 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 when you do that, communing in nature it's supposed to bring visions into your mind, right? You're supposed yes. to actually, and those are true visions. Those aren't just hallucinations. Absolutely. Uh-huh. Absolutely. So, yes. so chief, you've done that and you've actually experienced the, those at that, the, that ecstatic experience of that vision. Yes. That- I, I actually, I stood out twice. Uh, the first time was an epic failure. <laughs> <laughs> when you because tried the, the first time, the first time I tried to stand out, um, you know, the funny thing is you want to go out there and learn and you want to go out there and learn from all the different wildlife and, and nature and have something come speak to you and tell you what you're going to do. And really, the one that's speaking to you is your own brain. And you, the first thing you need to do is go through the process of breaking down your thoughts and making sure that you're clear to receive the messages that you need to receive when they come. Because it's not a matter of just going up and, uh, you know, tapping an ancestor on the shoulder and saying, hey, you know, what are you going to help me with here? You know, it's a matter of earning it. And part of earning that is getting rid of the ego. It's, it's getting open by breaking your mind, you know, by breaking your system down to the process of, you know, you being a vessel for creator to come tell you uh, through his relatives, through our relatives, through all of us, what we need to do. Wow. So, you know, for 10 years you were studying, how did you support yourself during those 10 years of study? Oh, uh, I was still working. I was still going out and doing things. And, and uh, you know, and it's funny because um, you go out there and it's, it's really hard to walk that life because you're, you're at home and you're trying to be as traditional as possible. Now I say traditional and I'm talking to you on, on zoom and on virtual reality. So there's, there's, everything is a balance, you know? Um, But, you know, you try to do everything in a traditional way, but then you go out there and it, it, you're constantly berate, you know, the barrage of statements that is given to you um, to remain calm about you know, especially as a, as an indigenous person. And that goes back to the stereotypes of uh, Hollywood and mascots and all those things, because it, it, unlike any other culture, the thing that happens to us is people are so desensitized that the first thing they want to ask me is if I made it rain, (laughs) you know, Uh, and there, there would be no comment like that to any other race of, of what their stereotype would be. Uh, no, no, it happens to us. Form. It happens to us all the time. It happens. Th- it? They were working as a chef. Is yes, that- my whole life I was a chef. Yep. Uh, so yep. you were, uh, when I say a chef, we, we were, you're not a short order cook. You were actually the guy in the back creating the the. the no, the, I was the a menu. line chef. I was a line chef. I did the physical work of cooking. Uh-huh. I was, so other words, was known as the line chef. You were the line so, chef. So you were taking yeah, orders from you were taking orders from somebody else. How much? How much yes. potatoes and how much stuff to put on the plate? 
Uh, yes. And how much yes. to make. So that yes. was, the, and that was the way you were supporting yourself as a, as, as yes. and, 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 and chief at this point, you, I, I, I'm not trying to pry, but you, you, you had a wife and children. You, you, you were yes. married at the time. Uh-huh. Yes. And, and, yes. And, your, and your wife, was she also from the people or she was not from the people? Uh, not my first wife. No, no. My, my second wife is my current wife. Uh, so the wife, and, so when you began your quest, Right. You, you were not married to a, a woman of the people. No, no. So no. I, I assume that that, that it didn't go down so easily with her that you were changing no. your life. <laughs> right. In fact, I didn't, I didn't, I actually didn't come back to the culture until the separation of that marriage, because that marriage was steeped in alcohol. And uh, there was an, a lot of uh, just bad things going on. And then once I left that marriage, that's when I came back to the culture. So, uh, uh, we had done some things that were, you know, um, like native going to powwows and stuff like that, but I never really started going back to the culture till after separation from the first relationship, the first I, marriage. I think that underscores a little bit what I hinted at before that mm-hmm. why the, the spiritual awakening occurred, you're able to change your life and now you're not you're no longer a chef anymore you don't need to support yourself this way no. right right so that's and true I, now i and i know now of course you work in in, in waymart and perhaps yes. with others but that isn't is that your main is that your main vocation now is to work with uh persons in, who are incarcerated is that your main vocation now that is part of it the other part of it is working with my tribe um doing ceremonies for my people um, that's, that's, I've immersed myself very much back into my culture over, especially since 2015, when I left my full-time career, mm-hmm. I've been able to, I've been blessed and led by the spirits to be able to come back around and do the things that, uh, I believe when I stood out in my vision quest, I was being led to do so. It's all that part of that journey. So tell me, let, let, let's, uh, you know, I, I'm sure it, it clearly was the hand of, of your gods leading you and your ancestors mm-hmm. leading you there. But I know there must be a particular story of how it was, and let's call Yitzchak in on this, how it was mm-hmm. that the chief became associated with, 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 with your facility, Yitzchak. How was it that he became uh, the person that you count on so much in dealing with indigenous peoples there? So how did, how did that occur? Well, when, when I got hired as the uh, facility chaplaincy program director at Waymart, I was told that the first, my first priority was to find a Native American chaplain. We had one uh, who had passed away. He had cancer. He passed away about, probably four years before, four or five years before I started working there. And it left a major vacuum in the chaplaincy department there, even though, again, it was someone who like Chief Demond comes once a week, usually. <clears throat> I believe uh, Chief Mike maybe even came less than that, but that was a major, major hole in our uh, in our department. And that was, it was fascinating because we did not have a Protestant chaplain. You know, that was an afterthought. The Native American chaplain for a much smaller community, that was a major focus. And I was doing a lot of work looking all over, trying to find somebody. And one of the inmates actually um, mentioned Chief DeMunn to me, but I forgot, I couldn't find him. And then eventually I did find him. And uh, we, independently of that inmate, and when I mentioned to the inmate, he said, well, I told you about him. And I it just, I, I, so I guess, you know, <laughs> like we would say, you know, the divine providence, it wasn't the right time until it was the right time. But then when we found when I found the chief, he was very interested in this. I was trying to reach out to a number of other people, people who he knew, uh, other people. And, and the chief told me those that, that, that might not have been the best ca- uh, candidate for this type of work. But it, this right. was a perfect, this was really a perfect match, a, a shidduch, we would say, you know, for uh, for what we needed at Waymart. And it really changed that community, which, we, you know, we've kind of discussed before how, you know, mm-hmm. it, it really turned things around and helped us and the whole you know all of my supervisors you know they always tell me how indebted we are to the chief because he's really good for 
for what we're trying to accomplish. And uh, mm-hmm. that one made is, is home now. Even though, you know, you, you have a natural connection to the people, but just your presence among incarcerated individuals gives you a connection to the greater population there. Have you found that as well, that you've been ministering even to non people, people who are not from the tribes? Have you been? Yes. Also- yes, absolutely. There, there is, um, there, there are groups of people there that, that are very much interested and it's, I think it's a good place that we're at um, right now in our history uh, as Lenape people that there are people that are not indigenous, but they want to learn the earth way. They want to learn how to walk more softly on the earth and they want to learn how to fix some of the mistakes that this industrialization has made. So that is good because that's good for our grandchildren's grandchildren. And that, that was one of the main things that I was taught. And that, that's another reason that I, I, I love, I really enjoy working with Rabbi Joe I don't know if I can say the other name. I don't know if I can get that out yet or not. I'll have to practice that. You, you have to, you, you have to, <laughs> it comes from deep in the throat. <laughs> can you, okay. It's like you're spitting a little bit. It's like you're bringing up spit, spittle. <laughs> it's huck. It's huck. <laughs> it's huck. <Okay>. It's huck. <laughs> yes. that's, a, that's a tough one. Uh, it's huck. It, yes, but go it, ahead. It's, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's good because we need, you know, when, when I was asked to come in there, I I thought about it for a, a while because I, I was kind of, you know, these guys are, these guys are brought into the prison system because they did something wrong. They're there for a reason. It's not a vacation place for them, you know? And my goal is that when they learn the ceremonies for me, and when they learn the stories from me that when they are back out into the population of the world, they bring some of that goodness that hopefully I'm working towards back to their families and to their people. And they, they change their lives, you know, and, and are truly rehabilitated when they come out. I don't want to see them again. You know, I tell them when they're getting ready to leave us, it was really nice knowing you, but unless I see you at a powwow or I see you at a ceremony, I don't want to see you again because that means I'm seeing you in here. And that's not, that's not my goal. You know, um, did you feel, you know, that you're, I know the answer to this, but I want you to bring it out for me a little bit. Did you feel that the struggles you had with alcoholism that you mentioned and drug use and other things? does that did that give you a very special way to speak to some of these individuals because you had been where they were absolutely absolutely it's you know it's not something that i'm proud of but it's something that um now that i'm immersed in my culture and in my spirituality i can use to help others understand that you know if you can just calm your mind enough and open your heart you can see that this culture is really good for you and you can see that this is the way that you need to walk because, you know, we, um, uh, my aunts in my personal family tree in 1890, uh, my great grandmother on my father's side was one of uh, nine children and she was the only one to survive the, an outbreak of, of smallpox. Uh, the smallpox. smallpox. So, yes. You know, it's, it's, you know, she was, if I say, you know, by that much, I'm here, <laughs> you know, That's right. I understand that with that one moment, you know, I, I, um, so no, it's a, it's a, it's a balancing act though. You talk about the dream yes. walk. It's a balancing act to recognize the, the past and still not be weighed down by bitterness to the point that you can't yes. be constructive. And I think that's, yes. that's something which we all struggle with. Many members of our religion uh, mm-hmm. turn to aggressive agitation because they they feel they feel they were wronged to the point that they become mm-hmm. destructive members of society. It's very. Yes. I think that balance is not that easy to achieve. You need to to be aware of the past and recognize what has what has happened, but not in yes. a way that you feel you need to tear down 
what's here and just lash right. out in anger. So how are you, you know, how are you able to counsel to realize that there's certain prejudices, like you said, it's going to take years to dissipate. The idea of the stereotypical drunken Indian or whatever it is, is mm-hmm. going to take a long time. We can get rid of the mascots, but it's still going to be a while till, till the playing field is right. flat and round. What do you counsel your, your, yourself and the incarcerated persons to be able to be constructive members of this society, despite the prejudice that exists. I, I always try to impress on, on the guys that are incarcerated that the important thing now for them is to understand the balance, that not everything is going to be perfect, not everything is going to be good. Even when they get out again and they're back in society, there's going to be moments where they're going to be tested. But what they have to do is understand that they're on a path. It's not, um, it's not a, a moment in time. It's a journey from birth to death to beyond that they have to understand that they're here to learn. So when, instead of reacting in anger, they need to open their eyes and open their ears and listen to what's going on and find out where their places in it what what part they have in it so that they can correct it that part because you can't control everybody else you can't control what's going on around you but you can control your reactions to it and a a lot of times um people that are incarcerated get in trouble because of reactions they you know there's their life situation causes them to react in a certain way and what I'm trying to do when I go in and, and do ceremony with them is show them a different reaction, show them, a, you know, either humor or spirituality or just quietness, stillness it works wonders to be able to still your mind and still your spirit and understand that you can't control the things that are going on around you, but you can control your reaction to it. And it's a struggle. It's it's not an easy thing to do. You know, it's it's a lifelong journey. Yeah, well, love is one of the hardest things to accomplish, to be able to love a person who and love, love being alive, even when things are difficult. It's a very exactly. it's, it's 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 something that you need a very a strong spiritual base and a guide and someone who can support you. Um we've talked on this program chief about perhaps is there a way that we could perhaps suggest that that persons of the peoples when they step out of bounds and when something happens instead of putting them in our system and then bringing in people like yourself to apply some salve or balm is there some way that perhaps they can be sent or brought in front of a, a, a tribal court to discuss what they did wrong and punish them accordingly. What do you think of that idea? Well, there are a few tribes um, now that can do that. They, they have been able to um, have their own tribal governments. Uh, usually it's out in the West areas, out in the, the Midwest. And um, the, the problem that has happened with that is corruption um, from outside sources. But I have seen it, uh, especially up in uh, the further outreaches of Canada and um, uh, Alaska and that area, there are actually tribal governments that decide the fate of somebody that does something wrong. And the, the Canadian government and the United States government and Alaska, the, the Alaskan government allows it to happen. They'll send the people to tribal court and the tribes decide um, what the fate is. Usually it's a, a period of uh, banishment. We had a, you know, our traditional ways is if you, you were, you were free to be an individual, but you were always that individual in respect to the good of the whole of the community because it was based on survival so the the complication with that system is that now see um, here you know like I said walking in two worlds I can easily survive if I wanted to 
without tribal law. So that makes it the point of, you know, you don't have to do anything. So you're saying your so you're, you're saying being banished today, if that would be the ultimate uh, punishment, would mean okay. Yes. I'm just I'm just going to go back and live like the white man, so to speak, and and just fit. Right. Uh, yeah, so another, you just walk away and go back to your house. But but some communities that are further out there, they'll put. They had. Um, I know there was an Inuit. Uh, couple of young Inuit men that were put on an island for two years. They were banished from their tribe for two years and they had to go survive that. And then when they came back, they were forgiven for what they did. You know, so the, and, the, and the other thing too is you have to understand that before the um, Euro Christian encroachment and before colonization and colonialization, um, we didn't have that many lawbreakers because we didn't have that much need. You know, we, we lived for each other in that if you were a hunter, your greatest respect to show your community was you took that food to the elders and to the women who lost their husbands before you had any for your family. That was how that worked. You know, there was never a need to steal anything because we had it. We had it, we gave it away. You know, if you needed something, it was, it was known you didn't even have to ask, it was brought to you. So in that respect, living now in today's society where everything is grabbed from everybody to be possessed by somebody else, it's more difficult to understand that, that tribal law of, of giving. I, I hear what you're saying. You're saying that basically this is a criminal justice reform podcast. Um, what would you say from your perspective needs to change? What would be the number one issue connected to your people that you'd like to see a change in, in order to create a more just society uh, for the, your members? What would you like to see again, in terms of uh, really, you know, as terrible as the reservation ideas were as horrible as the treaties broken were we can't go back and erase the past although we would love to be able to correct those things considering where we are now what would you say is the is the most crucial aspect of justice reform that would be relevant to your people my my personal opinion on this and and, um i have to qualify this and say that sometimes i don't always speak for my tribe I speak for myself sometimes, and my personal opinion on this is that uh, we need to be able to, um, as sovereign people, be able to uh, determine our own governance, as you were saying, uh, not so much in the laws, but as in the qualifications of who we decide, who we are, and where we belong in this society. We are constantly being um, oppressed and marginalized by by government entities and to the point of they turn us against ourselves they'll give and they've done this since the beginning of colonization they'll give one group more than the other and then they'll say to that group you're our group of indians you're our group of indigenous people so make sure these other guys they don't do anything you know, make sure you keep them down because otherwise we're going to make them our Indians and you guys are going to be in their position. This happened from the time the first battles that ever happened, they used Indian scouts from one tribe against the other, you know, um, and that, that was that was what they were doing. They were whispering in their ear that happened from the time of um, when the when the Dutch first came here and then the Swedish and then the British and the French and the Spanish and, and all of them could turn us um, not against each other, but against other tribes because we were individual tribes. We were fighting for survival. So we would have to, you know, take a side and hope and pray we picked the right side. And it was never the right side. Uh, My people in this, in the revolutionary war helped my ancestors helped George Washington at Valley Forge during the siege. And during that time, he promised us we would be an original colony. And that when he became in power of the new government, 
that he would make sure that the Delaware nation, the Lenape people, would be a state in the Union, a colony in the Union, was, was what it was then, and that we would have equal power. What he failed to tell us at the time was that it would involve being ratified by Congress, by the Continental Congress. So we helped them, and we fought in the Revolutionary War on the side of the what we called the Long Knives, the settlers, and we immediately got pushed further west afterwards, our, our main bodies of people. Wow. And that, that, that process of that forward, you, ha- you have to understand that process of constantly being moved and, and shuttled or assimilated or hiding out or going north or going west or not knowing where to go, that becomes... A matter of survival to the point it, it causes bilateral oppression to where instead of us fighting for our rights as a group we're too busy fighting for our little pieces of bread and crumbs over here as individual groups so we end up in, a, in major battles with each other about who's going to get what piece of pie no, no, no doubt with chief no doubt that the, 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 the history is 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 full with betrayal and mm-hmm. and pain I guess I guess I didn't make my question clear. <laughs> what, okay, sorry. What, right? You know, and 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 and, and believe me, I I, I I understand. Although I mm-hmm. understand your, I, I can hear the pain in your voice. I can't say I understand it. That would be presumptuous of me to say I understand, <laughs> because because <laughs> I, I I am trying to understand. But what I would say is mm-hmm. what is, the, from when you look at it, like for example, one of the things we've talked about is people should be brought to trial quicker that certain certain things should be decriminalized certain actions mm-hmm. certain like like what would you say where when you look at your people and say what is one of the things that's significant that needs to be uh, 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 needs to be addressed in terms of the indigenous people what is something now that's happening in the criminal justice system that we could perhaps lobby for, that we could perhaps come together with, that we could perhaps go to Congress, people in Congress and in government and say, this has got to change. We want this to change. Do you, do you have any point here of, of, of something that you're noticing that you think stands out as something that we need to address? I think, um, I think it goes back to self-governance. I think that we need to be able to be proud as a people of who we are. Um, one of the problems, one of the major problems in the state of Pennsylvania is that the state of Pennsylvania refuses to even recognize us as a tribe, you know? Um, so we don't even have anything to begin to talk about because they refuse to say you exist. And, and if you, know? you would be recognized as an independent entity, what, how would that alter things that would, that would allow you, that would give like community support, what would that do? If, yes, it, if it, the state of Pennsylvania would recognize the Lenape tribe as an independent mm-hmm. tribe, what would that, what, what, what effect would that have in criminal justice? Well, that would, that would have the effect of us being able to teach our children our ways in a more open way, in a more um, basically sound way. Um, we could, we could, um, you know, possibly not that we're in it for the money, we're not, but that would also involve some kind of, you know, a program. We could have an immersement program for our culture, for our language, for our spirituality to where, yes, the the kids do have to learn how to live in this society, but we could have more influence on them. I get it. In other other words, there would be less, there would would be less criminalization down the road when you would have a greater support structure starting. So instead of being this vague confederacy of, of peoples, if it would be sanctioned Mm -hmm. officially and given some money by the state and federal government, then you could run programs where the children would grow up proud and understand who they were. And there would be less problems in terms of being incarcerated i think that's what you're trying to say exactly yes okay i think i i think i got that i think i got that um because it has to start somewhere like you said it has it you know me going into a prison and teaching these guys to be better when it's almost too late it's it's one way to help but it's not the best way to help the best way to help is to catch it before they end up in there Mm -hmm. you know and and, And that's uh, that's the best way and, and, and there are other 
obviously there's other uh, tribes that have, have had recognition. Um, is there mm-hmm. something about your tribe that, that there's, or is it about the state of Pennsylvania? I don't want you to be hypercritical, but what do you think is the sticking point that's not allowing the cohesion uh, and the recognition to come together? Well, the, the, a couple of the sticking points is the fact that we did hide out for so long. Um, we, we were so far, uh, I guess you would say underground or, or so far unseen by the government that every stipulation that they have for recognition, we don't necessarily pass because we didn't have a government to government relationship with them from 1790 forward, which is what is required for federal recognition. So, you know, because if we did, we'd be in Oklahoma or we'd be in Wisconsin or we'd be in Canada with the other guys that did have that government to government relationship. So trying to reestablish the government to government relationship um, is very difficult when they refuse to admit that you were here because you knew you couldn't tell them you were here because if you did, you'd be taken away. So, Uh, so, so it's, it's almost like proving what you know is true but there isn't the paperwork to back it up correct well let's let's and, and we really appreciate your time i know that uh, mm-hmm. you know that we're intruding onto your private life and into your private life um if we could just you know wrap this up here um we started today and i asked you to pronounce how you would say your name in your language yes. and obviously your language is going to be different than the, the, the tribes you mentioned in Canada and Alaska. Mm-hmm. Right? It, people, the people that don't speak the same language. Right? This is obviously one of the Hollywood stupidities that somehow, yeah. you know, somehow people of, of the, of the tribes can somehow converse to people a thousand miles away who also yeah. 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 peoples. I, I'm not saying that, but, but yeah. clearly, you know, your language that you learned and that you could mm-hmm. probably speak. Um, mm-hmm. I would assume part of it, is stressing language as a bonding factor and for the young yes. people to be able, for example, you mentioned the aunties and the grandmothers. Yes. They speak among themselves, the ancient language, the, the, the original language. Some of them are starting to, again, they're, they're trying to, yes, we're, we're revitalizing our language. We, we, we have uh, workshops and classes and everything. We're really trying to get back to it. It's been lost. Uh, honestly, it has been lost, but well, I've been uh, honored I, I, to, I'm be sure able to speak some of it, and, you know, I'm sure you're going to be able to at least reconstruct enough of it to be able to create a sort of con- language yes. to converse. And look, if people were able to take Klingon and make a language out of it based on <laughs> yeah. based on a couple of you know episodes from Star Trek, they could create yeah. a language. I would I would yeah. I would assume the, the universities and other things could be behind yes. helping to create a language that is true to its roots, it's probably not going to be exactly what your ancestors spoke. That's probably impossible. Right. That's probably impossible to rediscover completely, but it's going to be right. close enough that it's going to mm-hmm. bond them in a real way to the stories and yes, to life. Exactly. Yep. Because that's, we, that's the goal. And, 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 and we, we hope that that's something that you live on the forefront of, you know, chief, yes. um, you have a very, you know, chief gentleman, it looks like the, the years have been gentle to your body. It doesn't, you don't seem, would you mind sharing with us uh, how old you are? I'm 62. So exactly like me. I mean, I'm going to be 62 in March, but uh, mm-hmm. I, so we're from the same, we're from the same era. So I understand yes, exactly sir. where you're coming from. God should grant mm-hmm. you uh, many, many long years. You know, we say uh, in Yiddish, we say, bis I hindered in Svansik to 120, which is of course oh. the, the age of Moses. Moses died till he, mm. Moses died at 120. And the Bible says that Moses was as strong and powerful at the end of his life. He was no more withered at, at 120 as he was as, as a younger person. In fact, when he was 80, yes. when he was 80, he, he, he led the Exodus. So I, I mm-hmm. give you, you know, for what it's worth, I give you oh. that blessing that this should only 20. be, the, this is only the half point mark, 62. You should, you should merit to to continue and hopefully see like Moses did uh, a generation oh. that is changed a generation that is ready to live in the promised land and of course we know oh. that that land has a physicality as well thank you so much for being with us tonight you've really enlightened thank us you. and take care
Going to... Thanks for joining us for another episode from the Yeshiva of Newark at IDT Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a single episode. Thank you.